Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We're glad to have you with us for our Wednesday evening Bible study tonight. We are studying the book of Exodus and tonight we're heading for Exodus chapter 10. So you may want to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 10. We'll be there in just a moment. And as always, if you have any questions, any comments or concerns about tonight's class, if you have something we need to be praying about as a congregation, we invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can call or send a text to 608-224-0274, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, we are working our way through the 10 plagues. So by way of very brief review, we know God has told Moses to go to Pharaoh and to demand that Pharaoh let the Israelites go, releasing them from slavery. But Pharaoh is very stubbornly refusing to obey the Lord's command. And so God uh, responds with a series of plagues. And these plagues are directly aimed at humiliating the various gods of Egypt. Well, so far up to this point, we've had the water turning to blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies, the death of the cattle, the boils, and the hail. And we've noted how each of these plagues was designed to embarrass and humiliate the various gods of Egypt. And of course, the first two were replicated by Pharaoh's magicians, but the third, the magicians admitted that this is the finger of God. This is the real deal. Uh, the plague of flies only affects the Egyptians, not the Israelites, and this will continue throughout the rest of the plagues. They only had to suffer the first few but that drops off after uh, a few of those. And so this is the first where Pharaoh offers a compromise, which Moses rejects, and he'll uh, extend a few compromises here. At least he will do the best that he can to try to work away uh, from God's plan. Uh, in our study of that chapter 9 last week with the plague of boils, we've got the first reference to God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And by the time we get to the plague of hail, Pharaoh admits that he's wicked, that Moses is righteous, but ultimately, once the hail stops, uh, Pharaoh hardens his heart yet again. So we've now had plagues one through seven, and tonight we are ready for plagues number eight and nine. So let's jump back into it tonight, and we'll pick up with Exodus chapter 10, verses one and two. Exodus chapter 10, and let's look at verses one and two. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians, and how I perform my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. <clears throat> So notice we don't have an actual plague here quite yet, do we? But this is something of a, a summary statement, kind of a transition between these plagues. God tells Moses to go back to Pharaoh yet again. And here we have what I think might be the second reference to God hardening Pharaoh's heart. So this is now beyond Pharaoh. And from here on out, it seems that the main point of the plagues will be, as I said earlier, to humiliate the Egyptian gods and to demonstrate God's absolute dominance over their gods, so that you may know that I am the Lord. And I also want us to notice that this is for the benefit not just of Moses and his people in this generation, but notice that this is also to be retold in the hearing of Moses' son and his grandson. So this is not just for the current generation, this is for future generations. This is going to be something so huge, so dramatic, that this story will be told for generations to come. And here we are today studying it in Madison, Wisconsin, the other side of the planet in the year 2023. So obviously God uh, accomplished what he set out to accomplish here. So let's continue on and we're going to move on tonight to Exodus chapter 10 verses 3 through 6. The next paragraph, Exodus chapter 10 verses 3 through 6. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land, so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled, and the houses of all your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. 
In keeping with the general pattern, notice Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and they make the demand. They've done this before several times. God is telling you to let his people go or else. And this time, the threat is for a plague of locusts. So this is going to end up being plague number eight. But if this happens, Moses warns that the locust will be so dense that you won't even be able to see the ground itself. The locust will literally be covering the earth throughout the land of Egypt. And also notice these locusts will not just be sitting on the earth, but they will be eating everything that wasn't destroyed by the hail previously. So I think there's a reason, of course, why the text explained last week that some of the crops in an earlier state of development uh, than the others, they escaped the devastation of the hail. But now Moses warns that the hail will destroy everything that's left, and the locusts will be in everything, all over the place, almost like the frogs. Uh, the locusts will fill your houses. And so once again, this is very similar to a, a naturally occurring event. We've discussed this before. Locusts would occasionally pop up here and there. This was not some unheard of thing. But this will be above and beyond in a supernatural kind of way. This will be something that neither you nor your fathers nor your grandfathers have ever seen. And of course, we have a uh, reference to a locust invasion or plague in the book of Joel. Uh, I, I personally think of the Little House on the Prairie books. And I can't remember which one it was, but the locust, I remember them coming across the prairie and coming up the side of the house and in the window and down through the house and out the other side. Um, but a very dramatic scene. But here, this would be even above and beyond anything that anybody had ever seen up to that point in history. So this is the threat. Now, keeping in mind what has just happened with plagues number one through seven, I think we might imagine that there is at least a remote chance that uh, any reasonable person might think twice about this. Because everything Moses has threatened up to this point has come to pass. And so Moses and Pharaoh have a bit of a history together by now. And, um, you know, a normal person might think that uh, this one probably also has a pretty good chance of happening just as Moses had said. So I think any wise person would uh, take advantage of the warning and turn away and repent and, and do what God is demanding here. Well, of course, <laughs> Pharaoh has other plans. So let's take a look at what happens next. This is uh, Exodus chapter 10. Verses 7 through 11. Exodus chapter 10, verses 7 through 11. Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones who are going? Moses said, we shall go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you, if ever I let you and your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out of Pharaoh's, out from Pharaoh's presence. Well, let's notice instead of Pharaoh responding right away, we find in this passage that Pharaoh's people step in, his servants. I'm kind of, uh, in today's language, I think we would refer to these kind of wise men maybe as the cabinet, we would say today, his advisors. And so they kind of intervene and they pretty much beg Pharaoh, uh, in a sense, to do what Moses is asking. But, of course, they're suggesting another compromise, aren't they? They want Pharaoh to just try letting the men go out in the wilderness to offer sacrifices. Well, at this point, then, Pharaoh brings Moses and Aaron back in. He wants some clarification. Kind of, he's willing to let them go. I want to work with you on this. But he wants to know exactly who's going again. I mean, that should have been pretty obvious by now. He is to let all of God's people go, not just a few of them. Uh, but it seems as if he's looking for a loophole of some kind. And he's tried this trick before. Moses responds, though, by basically saying, no, all of us are leaving. Our young, the old, our sons, our daughters, our flocks and herds, we are all out of here. We're heading out to celebrate this feast before the Lord. Well, once again, um, that's not okay with Pharaoh. And his big concern right now is that they not take the little one. So apparently he wants them to leave the kids behind, kind of to make sure the rest of them come back. And so Moses and Aaron, we end this paragraph with them being driven out of Pharaoh's presence. So let's continue then with Exodus 10, verses 12 through 20. Exodus 10, verses 12 through 20. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all that the hail has left. 
So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locust. The locust came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. For they covered the surface of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore, please forgive my sin only this once, and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. He went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Well, up at the beginning, God commands Moses, and Moses obeys. Moses stretches out his staff, and locusts come in never before nor since have they seen so many. Uh, they darken the sky. They devour pretty much everything. Nothing green is left. The land is completely devastated. And earlier today, I was kind of thinking about the contrast. When Joseph first came to Egypt, he saved the land from a terrible famine. And here we are 400 years later, and this Pharaoh won't let the people leave. And the land is once again destroyed by a famine. Only this time, they are not saved by God, but the famine is actually caused by God. Well, in verse 16, after driving Moses and Aaron out of his presence in the previous paragraph, Pharaoh now calls them back, doesn't he? He's in a panic. He knows who can fix this. And uh, once again, he confesses that he has sinned against the Lord. He sinned against Moses and Aaron. He begs for forgiveness just this once. Save my life. Moses intercedes on Pharaoh's behalf. The locusts are taken away. But once again, notice God hardens Pharaoh's heart this time. And he refuses to let the people go. So let's conclude tonight with plague number 9. Plague number 9. This is Genesis chapter 10, verses 21 through 28. Genesis or Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore, our livestock too shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we shall take some of them to serve the Lord our God, and until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Beware, do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face you shall die. Moses said, you are right. I shall never see your face again. Do we notice what's different about the process of this plague as opposed to the others? Did you catch what's different about the timeline here? On this one, there is no warning whatsoever. Instead of going to Pharaoh and threatening him, as with all the previous plagues, God now simply has Moses stretch out his hand to the sky, causing this thick darkness to fall over the land for three days. Once again, you know, darkness is not necessarily miraculous. We have darkness all the time, regularly, like half the day is darkness, so it's not miraculous. But this particular darkness is. It is supernatural. Like the other plagues, God took something that they were familiar with, and he amplified it, or he modified it in a way that made it clearly supernatural. And what's especially unusual about this darkness, first of all, is that it lasts for three days. Um, also, it was a thick darkness. It was a darkness that could be felt. 
And then it was also very specific in that it fell upon the Egyptians, but not upon the Israelites. So this was a discriminating darkness, we might say. Only the Israelites had light in their homes. That's a strange reference right there. I think this indicates that the Egyptians did not have light in their homes. So not only was it dark outdoors, but it seems to also be dark indoors for the Egyptians. So seemingly implying that not only did the sun and moon go dark, but even their candles weren't working. Do you understand? I mean, that, as I read into this, that seems to be the Israelites had light in their homes, which seems to imply that the Egyptians did not. And so in my mind, they're, they're trying to light their uh, lanterns and their candles or whatever, and the light is not shining. There was no light whatsoever. And so just an amazing thing. Imagine being in complete and utter darkness, and even your candles don't work. That's a strange thing right there. I would think that it's panic would very quickly set in, especially if this goes on for three days. You'd think you became blind. And in this case, you know, people don't leave their homes. They don't see each other for three days. So everybody stays in. Once again, Pharaoh calls for Moses. I'm assuming Pharaoh's servants um, kind of had to feel their way out of the palace. But I would also assume that as soon as they got out of the palace, they could probably see the light from Moses' tent <laughs> or his house from a long ways off. So they made their way to the only light in the whole land. They bring Moses to Pharaoh. And I'm imagining Moses traveling to the palace. And in my mind, he's traveling in a bubble of light. The Israelites had light. Nobody else did. And so they bring Moses to Pharaoh. Um, he gets there. Pharaoh has yet another compromise. This time he says, well, you know, you can take your kids, but you got to leave your flocks here. And remember, Egypt doesn't really have any flocks or herds left at this point. So I think that's why this comes up now. Everything's gone. Almost everything is dead. Everything's been devastated. Well, Moses, though, objects. that Nope, that doesn't work for us. That's not what I'm demanding. That's not what God wants. Because we need to go out into the wilderness to sacrifice. You know, we need animals to offer to God. We can't sacrifice if we don't have any flocks or herds. And then Moses makes one of my favorite statements, really, anywhere in the book of Exodus, when he very courageously says, not a hoof shall be left behind. In other words, Pharaoh, you are in no position to bargain. We are leaving, and we are taking everything with us. Then in verse 27, the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart yet again. And he changes his mind. He doesn't let the people go. And Pharaoh seems to have Moses uh, forcibly removed from the palace, kicked out, warning him that he will never see his face again. Well, Pharaoh, of course, means this as a threat. But I think Moses is okay with that. Uh, Moses agrees. You are right. I shall never see your face again. And this is, I believe, the last meeting between Moses and Pharaoh. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus chapter 10. In terms of practical lessons, I think we've got the reminder that God is more powerful than any so-called gods. And that's up there on the list of things we learned from the 10 plagues. That's what they were designed to do. But we also have a reminder this week about the danger of compromise. And of course, several times now, Pharaoh has suggested the idea of meeting Moses halfway. And Moses could have accepted any one of those offers, except for the fact that that's not what God told him to do. From a human point of view, when you're a nobody shepherd from the middle of nowhere, and you've come into the big city, you're now arguing with the most powerful man in the world, you know, leaving the nation with everything but your livestock, uh, that kind of sounds like a pretty good deal, doesn't it? Just to get out of Egypt alive would have been huge. So I think from a human point of view, uh, most leaders would have said, okay, uh, we're good with that. But Moses knew that is not what God had commanded. And so he can very confidently say that not a hoof will be left behind. Well, today, of course, God has not commanded us to leave a nation with our flocks and our herds and our children. But we do have the teaching of the New Testament. The world is always trying to get us to compromise. Let's make a few adjustments here and there. Let's make the church more appealing to the world. Let's tweak this doctrine a place or two to make this a little more palatable. And yet we dare not change the divine message. We don't have the authority to do that. We are not here with our own message. Uh, we are speaking on behalf of someone else. And I think we see this reminder tonight in the life of Moses. So next week we plan on getting a preview of the 10th and the final plague. 
And I'll warn you in advance that uh, last or next week's chapter is pretty short. It's a very short chapter, but it, it really doesn't make sense to chop up the next uh, chapter into pieces. So we're just going to cover a, a shorter section next week, if, if the Lord wills. Uh, this coming Sunday, Aaron will be leading us through the last few verses of the book of Jude. I think that wraps up our study of the one-chapter books in the Bible. We've looked at five of those this summer. And then we'll plan on continuing with Hebrews chapter 11 in our worship assembly this coming Lord's Day. We'll be looking at the faith of Abraham this week. Again, if you have any questions or comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, uh, something we can do to encourage you, if it's within our power to do it, uh, if there's something that we need to be praying about, certainly get in touch. Send me an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. And again, send me a, a text or give me a call at 608-224-0274. We'd love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the great king above all gods, ruler of all nations. Father, we're thankful for you demonstrating your power over Pharaoh and all of the so-called gods of Egypt. We pray tonight that we would never harden our hearts toward you, but that we would always believe that you are and that you're a God who will reward those who look for you. We pray for courage this week as we do the best that we can to hold up and hang on to your word. The world seems to press in on us sometimes, but tonight we ask for strength to always do what's best. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus. He came to this earth to seek and to save the lost, and we come to you tonight in his name. Amen.